Hello everyone, bringing you a video today which forms part of a project which I started back in 2020 which hasn't really progressed as I wanted it to but nevertheless I'm, I'm picking it up here with another video in the series. I started back in 2020 with videos marking the 70th anniversary of the Korean War which were related to specific points throughout the Korean War, so the arrival of British troops, the arrival of New Zealand troops, Australian troops and so forth. Uh, so looking at British and Commonwealth forces during the course of the Korean War. I've not really kept up with this in the way that I wanted to, but nevertheless I'm bringing you another video today in this series. And we're looking here at a recreation of the kit of a, a British soldier on patrol in well, circa September 1952. Now, by this time, of course, the British Army had introduced the combat uniform into Korea, the cold weather uniform. This, obviously, we're looking at here is sort of an autumnal or an autumn scenario. The kit was mixed and matched to a degree during the summer and warmer months in Korea, and then going into the colder months, of course, combat gear, the combat uniform, and the cold weather clothing would come into use. So we have a little bit of a mix of that here. And we also have body armour, which was something which was introduced into British service and, and Commonwealth service during the course of the Korean War from US stocks, and we'll talk about that in some detail as we look at the recreation now. Looking at an overview of the recreation here, it's not only apparent that the kit and equipment had evolved quite considerably since the end of the Second World War, but it actually evolved since the beginning of the Korean War itself. And the equipment is the most up-to-date equipment, the 1944 pattern equipment, and we'll talk about that in detail in just a minute. The inclusion of body armour is a major change, and again, we'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment. Looking at the weapon carried, first of all, this is the Mark V variant of the Sten machine carbine, essentially a 9mm calibre submachine gun, which of course had been introduced by the British Army during the course of the Second World War. The Mark V had initially been introduced and issued to airborne forces, and then became standard issue in the immediate post-war years, for a relatively short time before being replaced by the L2 submachine gun, the Sterling. The Mark V variant of the Sten had of course been tidied up with a wooden butt added and a wooden pistol grip. The front wooden pistol grip which would normally be attached to the barrel nut has however been removed as was standard post Second World War. Moving on to talk about the uniform, we'll start at the top as we normally do and in terms of headgear we have the cap comforter worn here. Fairly common to see it at this time when not wearing helmets, men going out on patrol would commonly wear the cap comforter. It's a very practical piece of field gear, especially as temperatures began to drop. The basic uniform consists of the combat uniform worn in shirt sleeve order. We have the shirt, and this is of a pattern introduced with the combat uniform at first appearing in 1951. And then we have the 1952 pattern trousers, which you can see here. These are distinct in having a button flap over the outside of the fly, as you can see here. Over the basic uniform, we have an item of kit which will become increasingly prevalent throughout the Cold War, and that, of course, is body armour. In this instance, this is a designer body armour actually introduced by the US Marine Corps based on their experience in the latter days of the Second World War. And this uses Doron plates to form part of the armour protection. And these were used extensively in Korea, not only by the US Marine Corps, but also by the US Army and by other UN forces as well, British and Commonwealth forces included. The British Army would not persevere with the use of this Doron plated body armour post Korean War, instead moving on to use the US Army's M1952A body armour and various derivatives which used ballistic nylon as the protective medium within the body armour cover. As already mentioned, the web equipment used is the British Army's most up-to-date set of web equipment, the 1944 pattern. This, of course, had been issued out for use in the Far East for the continuing war with Japan. The troops who had been issued this at the end of the Second World War were actually on the ships heading over there, but it never saw service in theatre before the end of hostilities. And it was used extensively. It was actually used by, of course, occupation forces immediate post-war in late 1945 and it was then used extensively out in the Far East. It was beginning to make an appearance in Malaya, the Malayan Emergency, in the early 1950s, and it arrived in Korea with 29 Brigade in 1950, and then essentially it became the standard equipment for British and some Commonwealth forces as well. Australians made extensive use of 1944 pattern, as did New Zealand troops deployed to Korea. It's worn here in a somewhat stripped-down configuration. At the front here, you have the ammunition pouches carried, as you can see. But at the rear, we don't have a lot carried on the back of the equipment. The haversack is not carried in this instance. This is a relatively short range patrol, so ammunition is carried and water. So you can see the interesting design of straps around the back of the equipment here. And this has obviously been opened out to be worn a bit awkwardly over the top of the body armour. The two items of equipment don't really work very well together. 
Flung below the belt, the aluminium water bottle is carried, and this is nested inside a cup carried in the 1944 pattern water bottle carrier. Slung below the belt using M1910 style hanger hooks and the eyelets along the bottom edge of the belt. The final thing to look at, of course, is footwear. And in this instance, we have a pair of the standard GS or ammo boots, the design of ankle boot introduced into the British Army in the late 1920s and worn right the way through into the early 1960s. These boots have been supplemented by the Boots Cold Wet Weather as part of the British Cold Weather Clothing System introduced for use in Korea. But in the summer months and certainly in the autumn and spring, when the Cold Wet Weather boot wasn't really needed against the cold, GS boots are still commonly seen. So that's what I've opted for here. And these are worn with short drab wool putties wound around the ankle, as you can see here. So again, looking at the overview of the recreation here, you can see the British Army in a transition period moving towards more modern kit and equipment. We obviously have the dyed green equipment with subdued fittings. We have combat uniform coming into use and body armour. So this is really setting the stage for the British Army in terms of the development of kit and equipment through the Cold War. We still have some hangovers from earlier periods, notably the boots, obviously the use of the stem machine, carbine and so forth. So a transitional era for the British Army. And of course, the war in Korea served as a bit of a catalyst for the development of kit and equipment, notably the combat uniform. And it's this design which would go on to influence the design of British combat uniform going forward. So I do hope you found it interesting looking at this. There will no doubt be more videos in this series going forward. Whether or not they'll be as frequent as I would like them to be, I can't say. It just depends exactly what I can plan and what I can produce. But I will do my best to make more of these videos going forward. If you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more of those, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and would like to support the channel, you can. Patreon and PayPal are both linked down below. And a massive thank you as ever to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. As I always say, it is greatly appreciated. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down there as well. That's everything for this video, so until next time, bye for now.